All right, good evening, my friends, and welcome to a Mag Lab Science Night, the first one of 2021. So happy new year, everyone. If you've missed our other science nights, in September we had an engineering challenge. Uh, so we discussed the different structures and what makes them so strong and strong enough to stand. In October, we talked about going viral. Uh, we explored viruses and how to prevent them. And in November, we learned all about lights and rainbows and why the sky is blue. Tonight, we are going to be talking about cryogenics and temperature. I'm so excited. And without any further ado, take it away, Miss Yulia, our wonderful MAG lab scientist. Hi, everyone. Excited to see you all in 2021. And uh, today we have a science night on temperature and cryogenics. And with us tonight is Dr. Mark, Dr. Mark Vanilland from the Mag Lab. Um, he is our cryo um, expert at the lab and his group produces all the cold liquids that we need to keep uh, some of our magnets running. So I'm really excited to have Mark here and we have prepared a couple of experiments for you and we're excited to, um, to guide you through them and talk about coldness and warmth and temperature and cryogenic liquids and temperatures and whatnot and have your questions. Uh, for our hands-on experiment tonight, we need an ice cube and some paper towels for the mess that you might be producing. So um, that being said, let's um, get started right away. Okay, before we dive in, let's start the first poll session. We want to get to know you a little bit better so that we understand who all is out there. Um, so please answer the poll questions. Can you see and hear us okay? Did you find the chat box? That's really important because we want to be talking to you guys and um, the way to ask us questions, as Carlos already said earlier, is to type questions in the chat box. And then our awesome chat master, Carlos, is going to pick them out and alert us to the questions. So please make sure you can find the chat box. It's um, on the bottom or the top of your screen, depending on. Yes, Carlos. Oh, no, I was just saying hi. Somebody asked if they could use water for the experiment today, but I'm assuming they need solid water. We need solid water, yes. We would need an ice cube. That would be perfect. If you have a frozen vegetable, if you, if as an alternative, that might work as well. Um, yeah, so I see a lot of you have found a chat box and then we would like to know how old you are so that we get a little bit of an idea of who's working with us tonight. And I see we have folks four to five years old, eight to nine, 10, 11, 12 to 14. And a couple of you are older, um, older than that. Then let's see where you all are joining us from. Okay, Tallahassee, Leon County, um, outside of Florida. It's good to have you all. And even from outside the US. Okay, it's exciting to have you all. So given that everyone can see and hear is okay and that we found a chat box, let's, uh, let's move right into the science night. Tonight, we start with an experiment and we need an ice cube and paper towels. And I would like to ask you all to take the ice cube and place it in your hand. And just let it sit there and tell us what is happening. Tell us what is happening with this ice cube and maybe what you feel and type your ideas and observations in the chat box. So, uh, so that we can uh, see uh, what's happening during this experiment, right? You can uh, probably see it and I have another picture for you guys here um, that might give you a bit of an idea of what's going on here. Um, should have told you that if you're right-handed, it's a good idea to put the ice cube in the left hand so that you can still type um, once the experiment has started. Um, so far, they're telling us that it is slowly melting into water. That's the first observation we've got. Okay. It is slowly melting into water. That is awesome. That's a great observation. Any other 
observations of what is happening, maybe what you're feeling in your hand. We've got a wonderful answer so far. They're, they're telling us, they're observe, observing that the atoms are colliding. My hand has become cold, the ice is melting. That is a really, really good answer. It's very okay. cold, it's melting, it's making my hand cold. The ice is thawing, an excellent word. The ice cube is melting and it is cold. Those are the observations we've got. Okay, so let's work with that a little bit. Um, we actually have a poll session to kind of see um, where you think, what you think is going on. So the poll question asks, what happens when an ice cube is placed in your hand? The first answer is heat is transferred from the hand into the ice. The second answer is the ice cube's cold content is transferred to the hand. And the second answer is both heat and cold are transferred between the ice and the hand. And I understand that that is pretty tricky a question here to start. So let's see what, what you guys think. Heat is transferred from the hand into the ice, okay. All right, I say we end the poll here and we'll go through uh, what is happening here? All right. Okay, let's move on. Okay, so actually heat is transferred from the hand into the ice. And I'm really excited about this answer that we had previously and, and some things that we saw in the chat box because those were really, really good answers. Because um, the hand actually becomes less warm and the ice cube becomes more warm because energy is transferred from the hand to the ice. So energy actually always is transferred from a body at a higher temperature to a body at a lower temperature. So your hand was probably pretty warm. And when you placed the ice cube, you felt that it was cold. So there was a temperature difference between the two. Um, and um, we already heard about atoms in, in, the, uh, in one of the chat box answers. And um, I just wanted to share with you um, that particles like atoms, ions, molecules, and whatnot, they can move in different ways. They can vibrate about their position and they can translate in motion, but they can also rotate. And all of these are ways of, of transferring energy. And those particles are constantly moving. And as they do, they collide with one another. And a warmer object has more movement in it, so to say, in terms of these uh, particles. So it has more kinetic energy than a colder object. So the moving particles in the warmer objects, they run into the more stationary particles in a colder object and make them move more. So you have like an object that on a very microscopic scale is vibrating and moving a lot or the particles in it. And then the particles in the colder object are more stationary and they basically get moved by the ones in the warmer object. Yulia, we've got an excellent question that just came in. They want to say, uh, they want to ask, can I turn liquid into a solid by adding heat to it? Can I turn liquid into the solid? I don't think so. I don't think so because um, as we will see when we move on in this presentation, the warmer an object is, the more movement there is and the movement and the heat are associated with one another. So, um, yeah, that, that wouldn't work out. It, it exactly works the other way around. And I see Mark shaking his head too. So I got two experts agreeing on it. That's a good answer. And, um, and actually fitting that answer here, we have a, a little uh, cartoon for you guys where basically um, you can see here a thermometer that measures temperature of this object. And you can see that the particles here are moving much less than the particles in the two objects that are over here. And you can see that the more movement there is in the object, the warmer the temperature, or the, the warmer the object is, the higher the temperature we read. So the particles in the ice move less and the particles in the hand move more. So we're transferring um, energy from the warm hand to the cool ice so um, that the ice gets warmer and melts. And that is exactly what some of you observe. So that is really exciting. So I wanna introduce one term that is a little bit of a fancy word here, um, energy transfer and kinetic energy. So when we have a faster moving particles in the hand and when they collide with the slower moving particles 
water molecules in the ice cube, um, part of the kinetic energy or motion energy of the hand is moved from the uh, hand to the water molecules in the ice. So the kinetic energy or the motion energy of the hand is reduced and the one of the ice cube is increased and we're transferring heat in the process. So now I have a question for you guys. How long do you think this will go on? How long is there going to be something happening in your hand? How long do you think this will go on? Any ideas? When will this process stop? Okay. Um, I see some answers in the chat. What do we have, Carlos? They're starting to come in. They say that it'll go on until the ice is melted. That's the first one we've got. Someone says, I don't know, which is a perfectly valid answer. Um, until equilibrium has been reached, an excellent point. Wow, what an, what an awesome answer. And that is exactly what we call it. It's a, it's a fancy word again, we call it thermal equilibrium. So basically until the hand and the ice cube have the same temperature. And at that same temperature, there's the same amount of movement in both bodies in the hand and in the ice or water at that point. Um, and there's no further transfer of that motion energy. So this is an awesome, I, I, you guys are an awesome crowd. So uh, uh, Dr. Is, Yulia, I, I've got a question that just came in or an answer that just came in um, that I, I, I don't know if it's right or not. They said until the ice melts and becomes room temperature. Is that right? So um, the way I would like to think about that is, is that you have the ice cube in, um, in your hand and your hand is somewhat warmer than room temperature and it is in direct contact with, um, with the ice cube. So um, there definitely is an effect of the room temperature or if you were in a sauna where the room temperature would be maybe hotter than your body temperature, that would also be a really big effect. Um, but yeah, it is, it is basically until your hand and the ice cube are in thermal equilibrium um, unless there are some sort of extreme conditions like you sitting um, somewhere in an Arctic location and, you know, actually the, the temperature around has a bigger influence than the hand and probably the ice cube just freezes to your hand and your, your hand gets some icicles on it or if you're in the sauna and, um, you know, it's just so much hotter, the water will, you know, even keep increasing temperature beyond your body temperature. So um, I guess- For the record, I think we need to say that growing icicles on your hand is a bad thing. So let's not try that at home. Yeah, let's not try that at home. <laughs> also, um, also, I think this is a great answer because it really shows it that um, an experiment can have different outcomes depending on under what conditions it is performed. So whenever someone performs an experiment and a scientist, when we do this at the mag lab, it's very important, you know, to control the boundary conditions because if, you know, someone in, uh, in a desert does the experiment or someone in the Arctic does the experiment, the outcome might be vastly different. So it's really important to, uh, to also control your boundary conditions. All right, um, one poll question to finish off this part of science night, which is kinetic energy is heat energy, motion energy, or transfer energy? Hmm. Let's pick what, what do you guys remember. Kinetic energy is motion energy, okay. More takers for motion energy, transfer energy, heat energy. Motion energy, motion energy. Okay, I have most takers, I think, for motion energy. And um, kinetic energy really is associated um, with, uh, with movement and with motion. So that's a good answer, even though, you know, there can be a transfer of energy. And in this uh, situation, we were transferring heat. Um, so that was, uh, that was a little bit of a tricky question there. Okay. Moving on, we would like to ask you guys about temperature scales. What is a device called that measures temperatures and what unit is temperature measured in? And I'd like to ask you to um, type your ideas in the chat box. Any ideas? 
while um, I'm going to, I'm going to take the opportunity now while they type that in um, and the first answer it's measured in degrees. Uh, we got a question asking why does numbing happen? So if you hold the ice cube for too long, your, your hand starts to get a little bit numb. Do we have an answer as to why that happens? Ooh, I'm yeah. not sure. I we think don't have a biologist on hand no. today. So. <laughs> I'm not actually sure why that happens. I can only imagine that the cold, um, to some extent, maybe uh, affects your nerves in a way that that would happen, but I would not know what kind of process mm -hmm. that is. So uh, That's perfect. Let's go with the physics answer and say that the low temperature <laughs> makes the nerves slow down. <laughs> Yeah, I was kind of thinking blood flow a little bit. Maybe it reduces the blood flow at, at low temperatures, but definitely oh, wow. some sort of uh, yeah, reducing in feelings. Yep, that's a good one. Um, but uh, good yeah, one. I'm not sure exactly. Right. That's that's more of an effect of a human effect. Yeah, we need we need uh, Dr. Um, um, Grant to come in, Dr. Sam that's Grant, right. who is yeah. our our lab biologist. Um, so degrees, thermometer, thermometer and degrees, thermometer, Fahrenheit, F or C is what they wrote. I almost gave away too much. Uh, but then the next answer mentions Celsius and Fahrenheit. Um, okay, that so is yeah. awesome. And that brings us to these gentlemen. So yes, we have thermometers to measure temperature um, and we measure it in degrees. And there is uh, three gentlemen that did a lot of work on that. They're, uh, there's Lord Kelvin, there's Celsius, and there's Fahrenheit, because actually um, there's like three major uh, temperature scales, and they are named after these, uh, these men who have done a lot of work there. Major props to um, someone in the chat and the crowd just typed in Kelvin too, right before you showed the picture. Um, and if I can take a moment to look at this picture, and you'll notice that it is um, three old white men, which is why we need more minorities and women in science so that we can get some units named for, for us. <laughs> there you go. Um, so we have these three different temperature scales and they have actually um, um, very uh, funny definitions, I must say. So there's the Celsius temperature scale, which divides a hundred degrees between water freezing. So zero degrees Celsius in like, you know, freezing water and 100 degrees Celsius for boiling water. And there's Kelvin, which extends the Celsius scale to absolute zero. And what absolute zero is, we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, and then there is Fahrenheit, which is a temperature scale where, you know, the uh, the freezing point is at 32 and the uh, um, boiling point is at 212 degrees. And that was actually split up in a very uh, interesting way where the researcher decided I will put the zero of my scale where a, a mix of ice and water and some salt is in equal parts and 32 degrees is a mix of ice and water. And um, 96 degrees is actually the temperature of the human body. So um, in those days, they laid out those definitions. And, um, and it is still today that, um, you know, when we talk about the weather being in the 90s, um, it, it is close to um, what the, the human body temperature um, is and, and, and what um, Mr. Fahrenheit decided was, was a good way to split up this temperature scale. Carla. Fahrenheit makes no sense. Celsius and Kelvin are very logical, and I understand. Right. Um, I heard a story, and I'm going to say this because I don't know if this is 100% true, but I remember somebody telling me at some point that on the Fahrenheit scale, 100 degrees was supposed to be the body's temperature, but the person happened to have a fever that, that day. That is correct. Yes. Yes. So, um, yeah, again, it's very important under what conditions you perform your experiment and that it's possible, you know, that you reproduce your experiment and that you make sure that your measurement is actually valid. So yeah, due to uh, these kind of funny circumstances, um, we have the Fahrenheit scale the way it is today. All right, so moving from temperatures, we have another poll session for you guys. Please answer. The temperature of freezing water is zero degrees on which temperature scale? Was it Fahrenheit, was it Kelvin, or was it Celsius? 
and absolute zero is the temperature at which what happens. Actually, we're still going to talk about that, but let's see what you guys say. All right, zero degrees, water freezing at zero degrees. What temperature scale would that be? Oh, wow, we have a full tie. So um, actually the temperature scale at which water um, freezes at zero degrees is the Celsius scale. And then we have the absolute zero is the temperature at which, um, let's see what's going on there. There is no heat energy, okay? There are water freezes. So uh, that is one that we will still be talking about a little bit more moving forward. I am fascinated by absolute zero um, because, oops, wrong button there, I'm sharing the results. Um, Mark and I have had this conversation before where reaching absolute zero is a theoretical impossibility because just the very act of observing or measuring that you've reached absolute zero introduces heat into the system. So you can't really prove that you have absolute zero because the effort of proving it is going to ruin your absolute zero. And, it, and it's a great conversation. And in case everybody doesn't know, um, the Magnet Lab has a milli Kelvin facility, which is one of the coldest labs in the world. Um, and it's in Florida, which I always thought was ironic, but the Magnet Lab's also partnered with the University of Florida. And at UF in Gainesville, they have a micro Kelvin facility where I think they get to and Mark, you might know the actual number. Is it 32 millionth of a degree above absolute zero? Yeah, somewhere right around there. Oh, it's cold, yeah. Yeah, it's in, and in Florida. Yeah. <laughs> I know, it is a contradiction, isn't it? And oh. in that building where they uh, house that very cold uh, experiment, um, they don't want vibrations. We were talking about how vibrations introduce heat. They don't want vibrations into their experiment so much so that the lawn mowers outside were warming up their experiments and they had to get rid of the grass and, and fill it with rocks. Isn't that crazy how you have to control the measurement conditions? I mean, I did not know that. It's crazy. Yeah. Um, and those are very uh, time consuming and long experiments because it just takes so long to cool things to those temperatures that they would sit there for weeks waiting to get that cold. And now you probably wonder why in the world do they have these labs at the Mag Lab where they make things so cold? Well, the reason for that is that temperature or the temperature of a material actually changes the material properties. So we were wondering if you could think of things or materials that change their properties with temperature and I put some pictures up here just uh, as inspiration, but I know there's many others out there that change their uh, properties with temperature. So let us know what you think and type it in the chat box. What do you think? Um, what changes properties with temperature? Any ideas? Answers are starting to come in. Um, we got orange juice, water, ice, soap, um, somebody telling us that they're not sure, which is great. Ice, water again. Gasoline. Gasoline, yeah. Hot air. Yep. Because if well, it changes it. temperature, it's not hot air anymore. It's cold air, so. <laughs> yes. Steam just came in. Iron, cardboard. They're rethinking really outside the box now. Eggs. <laughs> Plastic. Plastic, definitely, yeah. All right, so um, that's all really good answers. And um, we did a couple of experiments for you and we checked what will happen if we make these really cold. What happens if we make flowers, bananas, or a little light really, really cold? So let's go ahead and um, they freeze. Yeah, what do you think happens when we do that? As these start to come in, somebody asked a question about the previous slide. Would boiling spaghetti be an answer since it softens while boiling it? Absolutely. Yes, that's a really good answer. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Uh, they will shatter because they're so cold. The flowers will form frost. They freeze. It might preserve them. The light will go out. Um, good I answers say, coming in. I would say we go ahead and we check and we start with the flowers. And um, Dr. Mark and I um, did the experiment for you. So let's sit back and have a look. show you guys that lots of materials change their properties at very low temperatures when they get very, very cold. And um, a lot of research is done about this at the MAG lab, but also household items and things that you see around you in everyday life change their properties when they get really cold. So um, Dr. Mars, let's get going. What you have there? So I have a container of liquid nitrogen right here. Inside is uh, something very cold. It has a lot of insulation on this container. So if I take this up, you'll see a little bit of vapor on the top, and that's water vapor in the air condensing. So I'm going to pour this into our container here. And as it hits that container, the container is very warm compared to the fluid. So it wants to boil off very quickly. So that's why you see all this vapor. What kind of container do you have there? So this is a uh, stainless steel container. Stainless steel works very well with uh, cryogen. Uh, but then I also have it insulated with a lot of uh, styrofoam. Okay, I love it. Okay. All right, now that's... 
Okay, so we checked out the flowers, but of course we didn't stop at the flowers. We also tried this out with a banana. And I invite you to join us to see what happens to our banana. All right. Well, that was the banana, but we had also promised you the light, and that probably is my favorite one for for many reasons. So um, let's see. Uh, let's see what happens. And if you like, type your ideas in the chat box. If you have any ideas, what happens uh, to the little light? I'm going to put these 
So, so we did, um, we did see that there were lots of changes. We had electrical effects, um, we had some material, more mechanical plastic effects, and uh, we did another experiment for you. Um, and uh, we would like to get your opinion on what you think is going to happen in this next experiment first. Um, and that experiment is about cooling air to liquid nitrogen temperatures. So yeah. what do you think happens if we cool air to these really cold temperatures? Do we get an ice cube? Does it turn into a liquid or does it shatter into many pieces? While they're Let typing that in, I have to admit that I got the LED answer wrong. I thought I was smart. I'm like, oh, I know the answer to this. And I completely got it wrong. Um, and I, I need to ask real fast. I thought that at the, by freezing the whole system, you would be lowering the resistance so the electrons would go through faster and the light would get brighter. Right. Why am I wrong? So what is actually happening in the material of this particular type of lamp is, I like to think about that material in terms of electron highways. So there is, um, or particle, charged particle highways, they are at different energies. So different um, highways have different speeds and hence energies. And um, by applying the voltage across that little lamp, um, you will basically allow um, some of these charged particles to change their highway. So to go to a different highway, they have, they, they have to change their energy. And that energy is emitted in terms of light. So, um, if you, um, if you cool that system down, actually um, what happens is, is that these different highways are pulled apart further. So um, for one charged particle to jump over to the next lane, uh, they actually need a different amount of energy. So, and depending on what kind of material is that, you know, distance becomes smaller or bigger, hence the color changes by, you know, um, emitting a different amount of energy in terms of the light quantum out of the material. And boys and girls, that's your introduction to quantum physics. <laughs> One of my favorite physics or, or science terms is that when the light gives or when an electron gives off a little photon, a little energy of light, um, and then they jump down an energy level, that's called a quantum leap. And I just love that science term, not just because of the show, ask your parents, um, but because it's just a cool science term. So, uh, all right, Yulia, hear your um, poll session. Okay, so um, I see that our answers are very much distributed. And um, I guess the best, uh, the best way to go forward is to do the experiment and check out if we end up with an ice cube or air turning into a liquid or shattering into many pieces. So um, let's go ahead and do that. Down. Um, this should mostly be nitrogen in here. Some 
carbon dioxide, uh, some oxygen, and all those um, should condense at a temperature near liquid nitrogen. So you can already see right now the balloon is starting to decrease in size, and I'm going to try to shrink this balloon all the way. And what's happening is the gas is condensing oh, wow, into it's a getting... liquid and taking up less volume. Much smaller. I started this, it was very, very tight, so I blew it up all the way. Wow, so Dr. Markey said there was carbon dioxide and nitrogen in the polymer? Yes, and each one of these elements is going to do something different in cold temperatures. So, it still continues to cool it down. Oh, and smaller. The gas is uh, reaching its liquefaction point and becoming smaller and taking up a less, uh, less volume. What's also happening in here is the carbon dioxide is actually turning into a solid. So hopefully I'll be able to catch it in a second. And you'll be able to hear a little wow. carbon dioxide dry ice. All right. So now that we know what happens to air when we get a dead cold, um, we want to show you one last experiment, which uh, pertains to this little card. So check out this card and um, what happens, do you think, when we fill the tank with liquid nitrogen? So the card could freeze or it could explode or the car could move forward. So um, I'm curious to see what you guys think. As, so as the as Ava is clicking in their answers, uh, Mark, is this the car that you made with your high school students? Um, yeah, yeah, I did make this with one of my high school students. So this is a liquid nitrogen rocket car. And, and just to describe it a little bit, it's, it's a stainless steel container and it's got a little, um, uh, also a little container of, of water in there. So it's really going to mix a lot of heat into the liquid nitrogen. So um, it should have a very violent explosion in there. And then there's also a nozzle on, on one end. So um, keep that in mind as, as you guess what happens. Yeah, for everyone that's in the room, um, and one of our one of our um, attendees tonight is a former middle school mentorship student. We also have a high school externship um, program. So we have programs for students of all grade levels. So if you're interested in working at the Mag Lab and doing a, a project with the scientists, come to our website and check out the education tab, and you can learn more about our programs. Um, Self plug. Um, they had a question. Um, they wanted to know what happened to the air in the balloon. They said they couldn't hear the explanation. Um, so real quickly, could one of you explain what happens to the air in the balloon? Yeah, sure. Um, so uh, the air was a gas originally, and a, a gas uh, is always bouncing off each other. The molecules are bouncing off each other, and that's why the balloon was all puffed out. Um, but as you get to colder temperatures, the distance between the molecules get closer and closer. And when it liquefies, they get very close and they start touching. So that's why the balloon started to decrease in size as the atoms and the molecules stop bouncing off of each other uh, so much. Cool. So I would say um, we have takers for everything. I would say that is um, you know, um, the card moves forward has almost half of the votes, but it's pretty distributed. So um, I would say we'll check it out and do the experiment. Yeah, Dr. Martin, I think 
Dr. Markey, I'm curious. What is that contraption up front there? Well, this is the liquid nitrogen rocket car. And it's going to show um, the difference of uh, volume that's taken up by a liquid compared to a gas. Okay. What we're going to do is we're going to fill up this liquid nitrogen rocket car with liquid nitrogen. Okay. And then we're going to add this uh, piece right here. And uh, this is going to be filled up with water. Okay. Now, in the upright position, the water and the liquid nitrogen will be separated. But when I shake it up, that hot water is going to mix with the liquid nitrogen. Ooh. It's going to expand it into a gas, and it's going to come out this nozzle right here, which will propel the car forward. Okay. Well, I'm excited to see that. Yeah. So let's go ahead and fill this. We have our liquid nitrogen here again. Okay. the liquid nitrogen car. And I'll have to do this part quickly because they're going to want to start transferring to me. I'll put the nozzle on and then I'll clamp it. Then after I shake this up, I'm going to put it on the ground and watch it go. Alright. Alright, you ready? I'm ready. Here we go. All right. All right. So what happens here? Mark already talked about it. Cold liquid nitrogen is filled into the much warmer cart, and there's also the hot water. Um, the cart warms the liquid nitrogen with the water together. Liquid nitrogen turns into gas and expands, pushes out of the nozzle, and propels our cart forward. So. Uh, here we go. And that brings us to the end of our uh, science science part of the science night. But um, with Mark here and so many uh, experiments, uh, we want to give you the possibility to ask questions. So uh, do you have any questions about the experiments we saw, um, things that happened, or maybe what we do at the Mag Lab with those cold temperatures? Um, make use of our expert and um, let us know what's in your head. All right, no questions coming in so far. Okay, uh, then I would suggest uh, we let Miss Casey speak about the wonderful library pick she has and maybe during that time we have some questions come in. Those were some awesome, awesome, awesome experiments. The car was amazing and the banana. Oh my gosh, the banana. So again, I am Miss Casey from the Leroy Collins Leon County Public Library System here in Tallahassee, Florida, right down the road from the wonderful Mag Lab. I have a few books. Uh, we do have a list of uh, librarian picks on the topic tonight, cryogenics and temperature. So if you're looking to get more into solids, liquids, gases, and plasma, I have this beautiful David Adler book that you can take a look at to explore that a little bit more. Uh, you can check that out from your local library. I have really hot science projects with temperature. So if you want to explore temperature a little bit more, I have that too, so you can hang out and do some other science experiments in there too. And just for fun, you cannot have cryogenics without Mr. Freeze from Batman. So here is a book that we have, which is pretty um, 
appropriate because Valentine's Day is right around the corner. I have a My Frozen Valentine Batman, which is about Dr. Freeze and how Dr. Freeze became Dr. Freeze. He is also a cryogenics or was also a cryogenics expert, just like Mark. So <laughs> those are so awesome, awesome, awesome. But I don't think he's like freezy like that. Yes, yes. So those are some awesome <laughs> books that you can check out at the library. And with that, I think I'll send it back to Yulia and Carlos for uh, I any got questions. questions. Are you ready? First, thank you, Miss Casey. Thank you, Miss Casey. Um, why can't we touch dry ice? Sure, I'll handle that. Um, so dry ice is is very cold. That's uh, colder than ice. It's not as cold as liquid nitrogen, but it's it's still cold enough that it will. Um, kill the cells in your skin. Similar to if you touch a hot stove, um, touching dry ice will kill the cells in your skin. Your uh, skin will, will blister um, because of it. So uh, that's, that's why we don't touch and that's why we have uh, special protective equipment. And then we wear gloves and safety goggles when we work with, with anything cold like this. All right, Mark. As humans, we uh, we always uh, we always try to make use of these features, and there's actually medical treatments for the skin that make use of uh, liquid nitrogen um, and the fact that it will kill things on your skin that not don't necessarily have to be there. So um, yeah. All right. Next question: Is liquid nitrogen actually a liquid, or when it reaches the air, does it turn into gas? Uh, so it is actually a liquid, um, but also when it uh, is thrown up into the air, a lot of heat is transferred and it will turn into a gas very quickly. So yes, yes, it is a liquid, um, but it, it has the possibility to turn into a gas uh, with um, just a little heat and, and heat is provided by the outside because that liquid is, is very cold. If you put fire in a cold area, will it stay the same? Um, in other words, you can, have to... can you freeze yes. the flame? Oh, okay. I think now I start to understand the question. Okay. Um, Let me I say, can we freeze the so... flame? So I think the flame is part of the combustion process, which needs the, uh, the hot temperature to take place. So I, I would say if you, um, let's say you have a fire log and you bring that into a cold temperature or you douse it with liquid nitrogen, you would, uh, you would basically stop that process. So um, um, in, in that sense, I don't think you can, uh, you can freeze the flame in that sense. All right, is it possible for something not to be solid, liquid, or gas? I guess technically there is this other, I mean, we always talk about the three phases, liquid, um, solid, and gas phase, but there's also this, um, this uh, um, dare I say, mixed thing that we call a plasma. So um, I guess that's also a, a, a possibility. Absolutely, plasma is the fourth um, state of matter, and it's very important, especially in high energy physics. Mm -hmm. um, I've heard that it's very dangerous to get liquid nitrogen on skin. We talked about that, how that kills the brain cells, um, not brain cells, the cells on the hand or the skin. Um, let's see if you, well, we got that one. Um, why is it when you touch something extremely hot, it feels very cold for a split second? Mm -hmm. I'm not I don't sure. know if that's true. <laughs> oh, <that's> true. <laughs> Uh, boys and girls, whenever you ask a scientist a question, they go, hmm, you've done well. You've done yeah. well. I'm, I'm wondering if that is, I don't know. Um, I, I don't know that I've personally experienced that when touching a hot surface. Um, if someone has experienced it in that way, I can only imagine that, um, that both are a pain sensation and, and maybe that's how it's processed in the brain. Um, here's a good one that uh, we can't answer. How is liquid nitrogen made? Oh, yeah, very, very good question. So uh, liquid nitrogen is uh, made from the air. We uh, just, we don't actually do this at the lab. Oh, we order it, but um, the company that we order it from it, they take it from the air 
there's a process called the Stirling process that uh, slowly takes out each of the, the gases as you get colder and colder. Uh, I think oxygen comes out first and then um, liquid nitrogen comes out at uh, minus 370 degrees Fahrenheit. Awesome. Um, Mark, what happens if ice comes in contact with liquid nitrogen? If you submerge ice into liquid nitrogen, there's no other phase for ice to go. It's already in its sort of coldest, uh, lowest energy phase. So it's gonna remain ice, but it's gonna get even colder. It's gonna get to the same temperature the liquid nitrogen is. So it's even colder ice than the ice that you're used to putting in your drink. It's, it's gonna get very cold God, and it's I, gonna I become have... even more brittle. I can't wait to try that. Um... What state of matter is fire? Is, is fire plasma? I thought it was a form of plasma. I don't yeah. think fire is, is technically a material and it's more of just like a surface of, of heat coming off. What that, about that... lightning? I would say that is similar. It's not really a, a material either. So there is, they had a competition a few years back on the best explanation for what fire is. Um, and then they took that and they made a video uh, out of it and they had they hired big Hollywood professionals to do it. Um, explaining what fire is, is very difficult. It is not a simple question. So I would uh, urge you all to look online and see if you can find a good explanation for what fire is because it is not easy um, to explain. Um, do we know who discovered dry ice? I do not. Hmm. I do not. I actually know who discovered nitrogen um, in, in any form. Um, it was isolated by Daniel Rutherford. Um, one of the crazy things that I know. Mark, are you nodding? You knew that? It sounds familiar, but I don't think I would have been able to, to pull that out. And no, I don't um, know who discovered dry ice. Um, I don't either. But it was, it was probably um, the, the late 1800s um, okay. when they were going to lower temperatures. So uh, around that time, they were uh, getting lower and lower temperature. And around the turn of the century, uh, about 1908, they liquefied uh, helium, which was the last of, of the elements to liquefy. <laughs> All right, so I got two more questions, one of which I know the answer to and I can answer. Um, and they asked, um, what matter is space classified as? And you have to remember that space is called space because that is exactly what it is. It is just empty space. So space is devoid of matter for the most part and it is just a vacuum. There is nothing in space and that's why it's called space. Um, and Marcus, here's the last question for you. Can you reuse liquid nitrogen? Um, can you reuse liquid nitrogen in the container that was in the video? So after I poured it into the stainless steel container, um, yeah, it's still a liquid. We, we could pour it uh, back. Um, yeah, we, we definitely could reuse it. Uh, and something just came in. They wanted to know about dark matter, but I don't think we have the time for dark matter. Um, but they also said, you mentioned how liquid nitrogen is from the air. What is the process from air to liquid nitrogen? Uh, well, we did kind of discuss that. You said that was a Stirling effect? Uh, the Stirling cycle. Stirling it's cycle. Just, uh, just takes the air um, and, and cool, uh, cools it down to lower temperatures and, and extracts each element as it liquefies. Quick question, does the Stirling cycle, is that also what we use for liquid helium? No, no, there's mm -hmm. a lot of different uh, liquid helium cycles. Um, Gifford McMahon is I think probably one of your um, most used ones, yeah. Um, that's it, I'm out of questions. All right, well, then um, it remains to thank you all for coming out tonight. Um, we're excited to meet you in Zoom land and hopefully in the not so far future again at the library. Um, but for this season, we are um, on Zoom. Uh, you can watch this episode also uh, by going back to the website and all the ones that we had previously. 
Um, and we would like to see you again in February, February 25th, when we will talk about magnets. And uh, we'd love to see you. Also stay tuned for our open house. There will be announcements coming out shortly. We're having a virtual open house, which is going to be a very exciting event. And uh, thank you to Ms. Casey from the library. And thank you to Dr. Mark for uh, performing the experiments for us and joining us tonight. And with that, I give it back to Carlos for our awesome closing remarks. Remember, we are having our virtual open house. It's gonna be a lot of fun. And I will give you all a spoiler. I'm gonna be kicking off open house with a special presentation for adults and families called the history of magnets. So you'll find out when we first discovered magnets, why they're called magnets, why we really don't know where we discovered magnets and the whole history after that, all the way up to um, Joseph's um, electromagnets made here in the US, which were the first strong electromagnets. So um, join us for open house starting February 22nd and going that entire week um, and no more announcements. I just want to remind everyone that the Magnet Lab is funded by the National Science Foundation and the state of Florida, which makes all of you taxpayers stakeholders in our facility. So on behalf of the entire Magnet Lab, thank you for supporting our science. One last plug for me, stay nerdy, stay geeky, stay true to who you are. Um, thank you, boys and girls, and we look forward to seeing you later. Bye, everyone.